Chicago has always been an important rail hub. It's big, it's central, it's surrounded by a constellation of smaller major cities. And if you look at any fantasy map of future US high-speed rail, all tracks, or at least a lot of them, still lead to Chicago. So what we're gonna do today is analyze and rank the most important connections to Chicago, and it's up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggested topics always welcome. And this one came from one of my trusty patrons. I just want to see a video about high speed rail in the upper Midwest connecting DC to Chicago and all the cities that could be reached. Maybe Columbus would make a great hub city. Okay, so I didn't want to go exactly that route because I am skeptical about the value of connecting Chicago to the Acela Corridor for reasons I'll get into later in the video. But I did want to talk about Chicago because it is really a unique city on any future high-speed rail map. Also, in previous videos, I've talked about city pairs and I've talked about corridors, but talking about Chicago finally gives me a chance to talk about networks and something I haven't really discussed on this channel at all yet, which is the idea of network effects as they relate to high-speed rail, and I'll get to that later in the video. So this is gonna be different from my last video where I talked about extending the Acela Corridor South where the analysis is much easier since all the cities connect pretty easily along a single alignment. Contrast the Midwest Great Lakes area where there's just no elegant way to connect all the cities. You certainly can't line them all up in a single corridor. To set this up, let's take a look at a couple other attempts to situate Chicago on a high-speed rail map. The best of these maps, in my opinion, is what I'll call the Alon Levy map, which compiles the most useful corridors and city connections based on Alon's analytical approach. Also, let's at least humor this somewhat cursed map, which is still the one you probably see most often when people talk about US high-speed rail. And actually, I'm going to just take this one at face value and use it as a jumping off point for talking about the six spokes or radials shown as part of the Chicago hub network. Going through Milwaukee, Des Moines, St. Louis, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and Detroit. And no, I'm not going to analyze high-speed rail to Quincy, Illinois. One more note, I'm going to use my usual two-step analytical approach here, where step one is a gravity model that estimates overall travel demand, and step two estimates the proportion of overall demand that will choose high-speed rail, where the output is a ridership potential index for each city pair. I'm not going to rehash all that here because a lot of you have seen it already, but if you need a refresher, go see my recent video on the Acela Corridor. Okay, let's start with an overview of the six corridors I'm going to look at. For each of these, I included every metro area over half a million that I could reasonably hit with the alignment. And just to be clear, the point here isn't that these are all viable pieces of a future high-speed rail network. This is just me organizing the cities into six radials that I can analyze and compare. Okay, let's start with the Northwest, and our cities are gonna be Milwaukee, Madison, and Minneapolis, St. Paul. For each of these, I'll show you the 2021 metro area population estimates from the Census Bureau, and the distances I estimated for high-speed rail alignments. For every radial on here, Chicago is gonna be the city with the most gravitational weight, and usually by a good margin. The Twin Cities are a bit far to be a really good pairing with Chicago, about 425 miles, so air travel is going to eat into the ridership potential quite a bit. And Milwaukee's too close, about 90 miles, so highway travel is going to eat into that significantly. If we layer on the ridership potential index, or RPI, for all the city pairs, we get increasing demand for each segment as we approach Chicago, with the Milwaukee to Chicago segment scoring a 3.8. By the way, Racine, Wisconsin is considered to be part of the Milwaukee metro area, and Kenosha, Wisconsin is part of the Chicago metro area. I don't really have a comment on that, I just think it's interesting. Okay, so I need a new performance measure to score each of these radials, and what I came up with was a weighted RPI based on the route miles. So if you weight each of these segments by distance, you come up with an overall score of 2.3 for the Northwest radial. Is that good? 
Well, remember the worst score for any segment in the Northeast Corridor was Boston to Providence, which is a 22.9. So I don't know, good is relative, but 2.3 seems relatively mediocre. So against my better instincts, I went ahead and analyzed the West Radial, which is Des Moines and Omaha. As you'd expect, there's not a lot here. The Des Moines to Chicago segment scores a 0.7, and the overall weighted average by route miles is 0.6. So I don't know where this falls on the spectrum of national high-speed rail priorities. Somewhere above Quincy, I guess. Let's look at something more promising, radial number three to the southwest through St. Louis to Kansas City. Note that for the Chicago to St. Louis segment, there is the Illinois High Speed Rail project, which I have to air quote because it has trains running at 90 miles per hour with the ambition of increasing speeds to a whopping 110. Can we please start using a reasonable definition of high speed? Anyway, to continue with the theme, the segment approaching Chicago has the highest RPI coming in at 3.3, and the weighted average for the entire radial is 2.3, same as Milwaukee, Madison, Minneapolis. Okay, so far, not very inspiring. So let's go to the southeast, where the radial is gonna be Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Dayton, and Columbus. The corridors up to now have been kind of obvious, but this one involves some choices. First of all, once you connect to Indianapolis, you have a couple options. You can continue southwest to Cincinnati, or you can go south to Louisville. Ultimately, you probably want to do both, which is what's shown on both of the fantasy maps. But for my purposes, I just want one single radial out from Chicago. And Cincinnati is going to generate more ridership than Louisville. From there, Dayton is obvious, and I went ahead and added Columbus. Ultimately, you're going to want the 3C line that connects the three big Ohio cities, but for today's analysis, I'm just looking for the most efficient connection to Chicago. Indianapolis and Cincinnati are both fairly strong pairings with Chicago, so that Chicago to Indianapolis segment is going to be the strongest one we've seen yet. It's a 7.4, which, for reference, is stronger than anything we got south of Richmond when we extended the Acela Corridor in the other video. The weighted average for the radial is 5.5, so that's stronger than the other three radials we've looked at combined. Next, let's go east. The radial is going to be Toledo, Cleveland, Akron, and Pittsburgh. A couple things to say about potential permutations here. I wanted to hit any metro area of half a million or more that was reasonably aligned, so I had to choose between Akron and Youngstown. You can't really do both. Akron is bigger, so there you go. Note also that for my purposes, I just want cities that are within the gravitational influence of Chicago, and that really dissipates once you get east of Pittsburgh. However, this is the route you'd want to use to connect to the Acela Corridor. I'm still skeptical that you can get a rail travel time between Chicago and New York that's going to be competitive with just flying from Midway to LaGuardia. I mean, that's going to be over 800 miles. But you're going to build that line anyway just to connect intermediate cities like Pittsburgh. So the service should be there for people who just like trains. Overall, this is a surprisingly weak corridor. The Cleveland-Chicago pairing is the strongest, but it's only a 1.2. It's around 350 miles out from Chicago, so you're already getting a bit far out from that optimal distance of 250 or so. The Chicago to Toledo segment is the strongest, but it's only a 2.8, and the weighted average for the corridor is just a 2.4, so it's performing about the same as the Milwaukee and the St. Louis radials. Note that all the assumptions I use to inform travel time in my calculations go out the window as soon as the Hyperloop gets built. So this whole video is going to be obsolete as soon as that happens. Any day now. And for the final radial to the northeast, we're going Grand Rapids, Lansing, Detroit, London, Hamilton, and Toronto. Like the East Radial, this is one you'd ultimately extend further to Ottawa, Montreal, and Quebec City. But for today, we're just staying within the Chicago sphere of influence. I do talk about Toronto to Montreal in another video, if you're interested. There were routing decisions to make here, too. 
Kitchener is also half a million, but I can't see putting both Hamilton and Kitchener on this line. And Hamilton is gonna generate more ridership given the methodology I'm using. Also, you'll often see a Chicago-Detroit line Y into the Cleveland-Chicago line near Toledo. But I wanted to go ahead and pick up Grand Rapids and Lansing. It does increase the distance and travel time between Chicago and Detroit, but the additional ridership from the smaller cities seems to compensate for it. Realistically, you're going to do a much more detailed analysis to make these routing and service decisions. And I haven't even addressed metro areas under half a million like South Bend and Ann Arbor, which you'd want to consider too. This ends up being a really interesting radial in terms of ridership potential. You've got a couple of the continent's largest population centers bookending it. And in fact, the highest performing segment is the one between Detroit and London, which scores a 6.7. I just want to pause on that for a moment and point out that it's probably the nicest thing anyone has said about London, Ontario in the history of YouTube. The Chicago to Grand Rapids segment is a 6.1, so you've really got strength all the way up and down the radial. The weighted average ends up being 6.1, which is the strongest out of all the radials we're looking at. I still want to talk about network effects, including what happens when you connect two of these radials through Chicago. First though, quick reminder to give the video a like and hit the subscribe button if you find this kind of content entertaining in any way. I do have a Patreon since I don't really do product sponsorships. I mean, yeah, YouTube does run ads on my videos. I'm not running this as a charity, but I'm not in charge of what ads you get. If you're getting commercial spots for pickup trucks or crypto scams, that's kind of on you. Sub count check. The channel now has enough subscribers to fill Levi's Stadium, home of the quote unquote San Francisco 49ers but actually located in a completely different metro area. That's okay though, one day you'll be able to take California high-speed rail from San Francisco to San Jose in order to see the San Francisco football team play. Makes total sense. Okay, what I really wanted to get to here was the idea of networks, which we haven't quite done yet. All we've done so far is construct six discrete corridors. So the first thing to try here is, say we prioritize and build out our two most promising corridors to the southeast and the northeast, and we just want to through run the trains. Although I don't know that it would literally be through running, that would be tough, but let's just say you could. It turns out the only new city pair you've created that actually rounds up to an RPI of even 0.1 is Grand Rapids to Indianapolis. Nothing else really even registers at all. Now, let's acknowledge that this isn't gonna be the best example of network effects. You're probably not gonna take a train through Chicago if you wanna get from, say, Detroit to Columbus, no matter how fast the train is. But you're probably not gonna take the train through Chicago to St. Louis either. It's just not gonna be competitive with flying. The one candidate city that actually works here is Milwaukee. If you just did a 90 mile extension up the lakeshore, you do this and now you've added a bit more value for people traveling to Milwaukee from Indianapolis and Cincinnati. It's not huge, but you have increased the RPI of the Indianapolis Chicago segment from 7.4 to 8.1. No, this is really only valid if it's through running. If you have to transfer trains, then that's going to be a time penalty that's going to wipe out most of your quote unquote network benefits. This all comes back to the fact that competition with air travel attenuates any presumed network effects you might hope to achieve. If the concept of network effects is new to you, what it basically means is that the utility of a network increases geometrically as you add more nodes. It's a variation on Metcalfe's law. The problem is the fact that there's a dominant competing travel option as you get up towards 600 miles or four hours or however you want to look at it means something like Metcalfe's law just isn't a good framework, especially if your network connections require transferring between trains, which means a time penalty. The point is, I'd be very careful about assuming that putting high-speed rail connections between every possible city pair is objectively good. Okay, here's a summary visual for all six of our radials. Just something to chew on when we think about how to prioritize building out high-speed rail in the US. 
If you have other high-speed rail topic suggestions or other corridors or hubs you want me to analyze, let me know down in the comments. Thanks for joining and thanks as always to the patrons for their direct support. It means a lot. Let me know what else you want to see on this channel. Viewer feedback is important. I'll be back with a new installment next week and I'll see you then.